Say, oh Lord, is your name. Say, oh Lord, we praise your name. 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 Wait till we go up and go out, go out that way. That way there. Let the church say, man. Can we give our young people a hand praise? They have brought us a little ways into our worship, but we have a little ways to go. Those of you that are able to stand with us this morning, our morning hymn is found on page three. How many of you know the Lord loves you? Amen. All of us are somebody in the sight of God. Jesus loves me. Good job, right? They still they right there. Funny if you want to. Another couple years hanging out there. Presidential photographers. One of the only, if not only, African American presidential photographers. Is that right? It's two of them. All right. He's got his own calendar that he put together of official photos and the like he did. Wonderful. I got one myself uh, back in January. He has some with you. I got the real one.
Amen. On page four of our bulletin, our scripture reading is taken from John chapter 20, verse 19, verse 20, and verse 21. Let us read these verses together. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, when the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hand and side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. God bless you. May be seated. At this time, we're in the hands of our young people. Let's say amen as they come. don't know why the Lord keeps on blessing me even though I still do wrong he keeps his hands of mercy over me as I sleep at night that's his way of blessing me over continuously. Can't you see he's blessing me right now? How often do we take for granted what the Lord has done? Though it may seem so small to us He gave me eyes to see A voice to talk and legs to walk That's his way of blessing me Over continuously can't you see he's blessing me right now the lord is blessing me right now
he'll open up a window and he'll pour you out a blessing and it'll so be so big you won't have room for it yeah he's blessing and he's blessing right now isn't he right now
anointing in this sanctuary. There is a stillness in the atmosphere. Oh, come lay down the burdens you have carried, for in the sanctuary, God is here. Anointing in this sanctuary, there is a stillness in the atmosphere. God is he Speak, Lord. Speak, Lord. Ah, 
Speak, Lord. Speak, Lord. So come lay down the burdens you, you have carried for in the same jewelry. God is He.
Regina Snow. If you believe in the power, just stand up with me. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Come on. Come on. I can't hear you. Stand up with me. Oh. Oh. Yes. Yes. Let me say, just because you finish singing the song of the Holy Spirit is moving, you keep on going. You don't stop. Good morning. I didn't want to stop that. Because we continually praise his name and God has been good to all of us. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. I enjoy this. Uh, we are the 55 plus rhythm group is going to entertain you this morning and show you how much God has blessed us. We are old, but we are still here and we can perform. Good morning, Pleasant Green Church family and friends. The young people have really brought the spirit into the house. The spirit is already here. But not only, not only the young people can bring the spirit, we have the spirit during the week too. On Tuesdays, we are right here. I am very thankful to God and very happy to be a part of the 55 plus Wisdom and Innovation Group. We meet every Tuesday at 11 o'clock, weather permitting. We have a good time together. I have invited many people in my building to come and they say, well, what are you all gonna do? I don't wanna go out there and sit down and look at those old folks. But I just want to let you know that we don't just come and look at each other. We old folks have a whole lot of things going. Our president is Mother Rosa Kimbrough, and you just saw her. Uh, we want to remember God first in everything that we do. I would like to just give you some of the activities that 
that we carry out on Tuesdays. Now, we don't come out when it's too cold or whatever like that, but we are here all once. We are happy to see each other. We sing religious songs and hymns. We pray and read scripture. We listen to biblical presentations given by Minister Charles Willis and Mother Mabel Briggs. Of course, we are backed up by Reverend Armstrong. We have a short business session. We get recent updates about our sick, shut-ins, and families who have lost one, loved ones. We listen to speakers who have been invited to enlighten seniors about benefits or other health interests. Mother Carrie Armstrong always have a five-minute Bible quiz already prepared, and we got to do it in five minutes. We use our Bibles to find the answers. We have extracurricular activities. We are seniors on the go. We don't let our hurt knees or legs stop us. We move around with canes, walkers, and wheelchairs. Some years ago, we went to Kansas City on the Amtrak train with an overnight stay at the Crown Center. We have had several overnight bus trips. Mother Rosa Kimbrough plans all of the trips. She is very resourceful. We have gone to Branson, Missouri to watch religious live plays with real animals. Recently, one in 2014 was Jonah. And you know Jonah had the adventures when he did not obey God's plans to go to Nineveh, ending up in a large fish belly. We have had bus trips to the Amish country with home-cooked meals, Eckers Farm in October to pick apples. Now, everybody was invited to go. If you wanted to go on the tram, you could go out and pick apples from the trees, or you could pick apples right in the store from a basket. <laughs> we have gone to Josephine's Tea Room in Illinois, of course, the Golden Corral in St. Charles, a batch in Ferguson, and of course, Old Ponderosa. Our Christmas dinner was in December. We had it right here at our church. For the past three years, we have had our annual picnic at Vanita Park. Mother Ora Stokes reserves an, a lovely picnic area for us each year. It's clean, quiet, and the restrooms are closed. At night, fishing in that ship. Therefore, John could give a step-by-step -step account of the events that night. That's why his words are so startling. They are gripping, penetrating. They are sad, serious words, searching words. He was one of them who fished with his other brethren all night long, and they caught nothing. Now, in order to understand what happened then, we have to go back and pull up some background prior to this incident and go back to the day of the resurrection, Easter Sunday morning when Jesus got up. And when he got up, you remember that the women were the first to approach the empty tomb. And when they got there, there were two heavenly figures. They were dressed in bright, shining robes. And the angel said to the women, who are you looking for? And they said, we're looking for Jesus. They had bought spices to anoint his body because he had been there for so many days. And uh, which is a physiological problem, the flesh starts to rotting, and when it rots, it stinks. So the spices were to cover the odor of his rotting body. And the angel said to them, he, he's not here. He ain't here. He's gone. As he said that he was going to get up and rise. And when the angels told the women that, then the angel said, go back and tell what? His disciples that he is risen from the dead. And we know that when the women left there, going on their way, they what? They come to Jesus, and they recognize him, 
And we are told that they fell at his feet, they grabbed his feet, and Jesus said, no, no, don't touch me now. I have not ascended to my father. But what I want you to do, I want you to go and tell my brethren to meet me where? In Galilee. That's what Jesus told the women to tell the disciples. All right. The disciples, they go to Galilee. And they're waiting there on Jesus Christ. And as they're waiting, as usual, Peter, the initiator of all action, who is impetuous, who always leaps before he looks. Peter, obviously, and John does not indicate it in the text, but Peter possibly got tired of waiting. He became a little bit restless. So Peter told his other brother, I'm going fishing. And then the other boy said, well, Peter, if you're going, we're going to go fishing with you. So all of them left, got in the ship, and started fishing that night on the Sea of Galilee. And by the way, there are some of the gospel writers call the Sea of Galilee, there's another name for the Sea of Tiberias, which is the same body of water. And as they were fishing all night long, when the dawn came and chased back the darkness of the night, and there they were washing their nets in the boat, and they had nothing. All night long, all night long, maybe six, seven, or eight hours, and they had nothing to show for their toll. Peter said, I'm getting out of here. And they said, well, Peter, if you're going, we're going with you. Most of those men in that boat, they knew the sea. They went back to their original occupation. They were familiar with the fishing business for this before Jesus called them to follow him. This was their living. They were dependent on the sea, and they knew how to get fish out of the sea. They also knew where the school of fish were. They knew when to fish, and the best time to fish was at night when it was cool, when the fish would come to the surface of the water. They knew where to go to catch the fish. They knew how to fish to catch them. They had collected all of their years of experience from young men coming up. And they put all of their experience together. And with all of their experience, they lost the big catch. But in spite of all of their know-how, all of their togetherness, they fished all night and caught nothing. Now I want you to mentally, I want you to look at them in your minds. As the night is pushed away by the dawn, brand new day, there they are in the dawn's early light, downcast, disgusted, disappointed. They're tired, they're sweating, they are exhausted, they are weary, they are sad. And when they look at their tally sheet, it shows nothing for the entire night's labor. The atmosphere is punctuated with defeat and despair. Their shoulders are sloping. They are standing in the boat washing their empty nets. When John pins these words, and they fished all night and they caught nothing I can't speak for you but to me there's something wrong with this scene here these disciples were not just ordinary now and then fishermen they were not novice they were not beginners hoping to be lucky they and most of them were fishermen what by profession the Bible tells us that James and John had a fish uh, business with their father Zebedee. 
Andrew, which was Peter's brother, he also could fish. We know that Peter also was one of the best fishermen in the business. What then was wrong with this statement? Let's shed some light on this mystery that they fished all night and they caught nothing. They were hurt. They were, they were humiliated. But they left something out of the equation. And you know what that was? Jesus. That's the reason why they fished all night and caught nothing. When the dawn came, Jesus was standing on the shore. He had cooked breakfast. They could smell the fish. They could smell the bread. The Lord of life was there. The master of the sea was there. The living word was there. Like John says in his first chapter, first three verses, in the beginning, what? Was a word. The word was with God. The word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made, what? By him. And without him was not anything made that was made. This is Christ, the Savior, the Son of the true and living God. Jesus says to them, without me, ye can what? Do nothing. Now we found the key to what was wrong on the Sea of Galilee. The problem there is over with. The mystery is solved. Those tired, perplexed disciples had temporarily what? Forgotten Jesus Christ. They forgot his, dem his demand in Matthew chapter 4 verse 19 where he said to them, drop your nets. I don't want you to be catching fish anymore because the live fish that you are catching will die. From here on in, I want you to catch dead men so that they will become alive. In other words, he called them to a soul-saving business. And God's call right now is still a soul-winning call. Now, I must rivet emphasis at that point because before we go on, the purpose of the body of Christ, and I want you to listen carefully. I want you to listen with an open mind and a receptive heart. The purpose of God creating his church. Let it sink in. Not our church. He didn't create a building. And I know we're living in an age of technology and we're living in an age of uh, finance and big buildings and this sort of thing, millions of dollars. But the body of Christ, which is his church, he called his people to do one specific thing, and that is to lead other souls to Christ. Now, I know you don't want to hear it. Because we do everything else in this modern age in the church except leading souls to Christ. We build, we, 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 we shape and fashion our plans. We go here and we go there. And we think that what we have done, God is going to put his stamp of divine approval on it and everything is going to work out all right. Let me ask a question. And this is a rhetorical question. Don't want no hands raised, but I want you to just think about it and search it in your mind. How many of you in the last year have led one soul to Christ? How many of you within the last three years have led somebody to Christ? How many of you within the last five years have led someone to Christ? In fact, within a, within a span of one to five years, how many of you have even shared the story of Jesus Christ with someone? Whether you were standing in line at a supermarket, whether you were on your job, whether it was your family, whether it was in the church, 
How many of you have shared uh, the story of Jesus Christ with someone? And in all of our families, all of our families, everybody in all of our families, myself included, all of our kinfolk ain't saved. Now we want them saved, but all of them are not saved. So the question is, do you pray for them? Do you pray for their salvation? Do you invite them to come to church with you? Do you give them scriptures? Do you give them any literature, any tracts? What are you doing uh, to open up the window of their minds and their hearts to plant a gospel seed in their lives? You may not see it, but somehow God in his mercy, he will what? He will irrigate that seed he will make it grow, and he will bring it to fruition. Now, you might be dead. You might be in glory with the Lord. But somebody is going to witness the fact that you planted the seed. Let's look at the Apostle Paul. Every church that Paul planted, he did not see the result of everything that he gave. But he planted the seed. Paul knew he was not going to see the end. And it's not in God's providential plan that when you plant the seed that you are entitled to see the harvest. But God will give you some harvest of somebody if you are faithful to his word and to his task. Amen? They fell. They caught nothing because they didn't have Jesus. I don't care what we do in the church, how much money we raise, and nothing wrong with that. How many programs we have, that's fine. But if Christ is not at the center, it will fail. And I don't care in terms of how much we pray over it. Also, something else has come to my mind. You remember Jesus, and I can't remember the occasion, but when he healed somebody, they were asking him, how did this happen? And he said, this kind can only be done by what? By prayer and fasting. If you, have you noticed, I think it's the uh, prayer band, and it's during the month of August, if I'm not mistaken, third Sunday, anyway, how difficult it is for us to come together and to pray with one another. Amen. 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 I know you don't want to hear this, but I'm going to seal it to you. And you wrestle with it with the Lord. We call a members meeting for come. You say, we want to pray for one hour. You can get at least 30 people to stay. Everybody has an agenda. Everybody's busy. But then let a storm come and catch nothing. Then we want Jesus. You understand what I'm saying? If we put him first, the rest will turn out okay. But if we do our thing and then ask him to okay our thing, and if it ain't his thing, that thing is going to fail. Amen? Just that simple. Well, let me go on, because somebody's mad. And the Lord is going to bless you, and he's going to keep you. Whenever church or an individual when we try to do anything without God's power, presence, and plan, it will fail. Again, Jesus said, without me, what? You cannot do nothing. The flesh is not the king's way. Couple his plan with prayer, 
And we as a people have almost, as I said, depleted prayer from the life of the church. So they caught nothing because they didn't have the man to give them something. The other reason why they became victorious out of defeat, they obeyed by following the directions of Jesus. Jesus is standing on the shore. Picture them, this, this in your mind. He's standing on the shore. And they are there washing their nets. They're, they're sweaty, smelling of fish, disgusted. Ain't got nothing to show for all night long. Professional men now, you know, not, no, yeah, not kids, not guessing, but knowing how to fish. So Jesus asked him a question, which he already knew. And let me put it in my vernacular. Boys, have you caught anything? Got any fish? Got any meat, according to one translator? And they respond, no, Lord, we done fish all night long, and we ain't got a fish. Oh. Well, I want you to do this. I want you to get your net and drop it on the right side of the boat. Now, now, now listen to what John says. He didn't say the left side. He didn't say drop it behind the boat, in front of the boat. Come on, come on, spiritually walk with me. He said, drop it, boys, on the right side. And when they dropped the net on the right side and got ready to pull it in, the net was so filled with fishes until they couldn't haul it one ship. So they had to call the other boys in the other ship to help pull it in. Now, this is strange. When they get the fish to shore, they realize that even though the net is filled with fish, it didn't break which is implying that there once was a time when they did have a full net and the net broke, didn't hold the fish. Oh, come on with me. And then they count the fish. And they count 153 fish. Lord have mercy. Help us, Holy Ghost. Drop your net on the right side. He wouldn't, and spiritually, this is not talking about directions. <laughs> this is talking about obeying what God tells us to do. And notice in Scripture, always the right hand. Mm, mm, mm. The right hand is the hand of what, Flint? Fellowship. The right hand is the hand of power. The right hand is the hand of what? Authority. Cast your net what? Let me say it my way. Cast your net on God's side. And when you cast your net on God's side, don't worry about if you're going to get anything. All you do is just what? Get ready to receive it. I think that there are one of the songs that the young adults were singing, and I don't remember the, the uh, title of it, but in essence it was saying is that when you ask God for something, you got to believe. Because he's able. Is that correct? And then uh, get ready to receive what you ask him for, as though it's already been done. Faith is the substance of things, what? Hoped for, and the evidence of things. I ain't seen it, but he said it. And my daddy, my papa don't lie. Have you ever asked the Lord for something and got ready in your spirit to receive it? 
and you were in the midst of a dark night on your Sea of Galilee, your dark season, and if anything, it looked like you weren't going to catch nothing, nothing was not going to come in your life, but because you trusted him and you followed his directions, you prayed. And it wasn't a false hope. It wasn't, it wasn't a figment of your imagination. You were depending, you were trusting in him who said that I'll never leave you. I'll never what? Forsake you. You were trusting in him who said, if I be lifted up, I will draw. The gospel writer said there's power in the blood. Power! Hmm. As long as we fish on the Savior's side of the ship, which is the church, we will always have success. Now look at what happened. The same men that caught nothing at night, using the same set of hands, using the same net, fishing from the same boat, in the same area, but this time, they're fishing in day. And they cast their net on the right side, and they found fish. Oh, Lord. If you have failed in the past, you've temporarily forgotten the purpose of your holy call. By faith, get up, launch out, trust God, go into the deep of your calling, let down the net or whatever, Task God has given you for a divine drought. Fish in love, fish in hope, fish in season, fish out of season. Fish for Jesus Christ. Fish for his glory. Lead someone to Jesus. If you don't do nothing but just tell them what? The old old story and the gospel writer put it this way I love to tell the story what is the story of unseen things above of Jesus what and his glory of Jesus and his love I love to tell the story because I know it's true it satisfies my longings as nothing else can do. I love to tell the story. It's more wonderful. It seems that all the golden fancies of all of my golden dreams. I love it. It did so much for me. And that is just the reason I tell it now to thee. Then finally, I love to tell the story for those who know it best seemingly hungry, thirsting to hear it like the rest. And when in scenes of glory I sang the new, new song, will be the old, old story that I have loved so long. I love. Do you love Jesus? Let me back up a step. You ain't going to tell the story if you don't love the man the story is about. No, no. You know the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm going to give this physical illustration. You know, st stand up, Sam. Do you know the reason why Sam and his two sisters, why they, they celebrated the birthday of their mother? Stand up, Sister Nixon. Because she is what? Their love. If they didn't love her, they would not have celebrated her day. Say it. But because they love her, they celebrate it. You can go ahead and sit down now. Well, because I love Jesus, I do what I do. Or somebody said, I do as well I do. It doesn't matter how you put it. Good English, broken English. Because I love him. It's because I do what I do. And I want others to know about this lover of my soul. 
Have you been telling somebody about Jesus? Maybe somebody's saying, Pastor, I've been telling them, but look like they ain't listening. Don't worry. I got some stubborn rocks in my family. And when I talk to them, look like it's just whistling in the wind. But that's okay. See, you got to tell them. And when you tell them the blood is on their hands, not on yours. That's all you can do. You can't save nobody's soul. You can't open nobody's heart. You can't transform nobody's life. All you can do is what? Is tell them. But make sure the mistake is not yours. Tell them. Even if they give you an ugly look, even if they say, I don't want to hear that, tell them. Even if they walk away from you, tell them. Even if they don't speak to you again, tell them. Oh! Yeah. Oh! Tell them. Night season of empty fishing. But you don't have to fish and catch nothing if you have Jesus and if you follow his directions. Cast your net on his side and you'll have success. Now, not success in terms of the flush success, but divine success. And then all of the bragging and all of the glory, where does it go? And we can say nothing. All we did, we just, we were the what? The introducer, if that's the proper way of saying it. And then God, what? He did the rest. The invitation for discipleship. To turn loose those nets, if there's anyone here that you are entangled in, the net of your selfishness, the net of your arrogance, your pride, your self-righteousness, the net of your anger, the net of your jealousy, whatever your net is, turn it loose and take hold to the gospel net. And the one who owns that net, his name is what? Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. Oh yes, he's alive. And according to our calendar, two weeks from now, we're going to be celebrating his victory. For he is getting up out of the grave. And he's going to make the statement, I'm alive and not only alive momentarily for this moment, but I'm alive forevermore. And the keys of the kingdom my father has given to me. If you're here this morning... We don't want you to come and join a church, nor a pastor, nor a people. Because none of these entities can save you. We want you to come to Jesus Christ. He's the only one that can save you. Nobody else. Will you come as we stand? The doors of his kingdom stand open. For he says, as many as receive him... To them gave he the right, gave them the right to become the sons of God. To them that believe on his name. As many as believe. Is there anyone here this morning that believes in Jesus Christ? Will you come?